and this controversy that you have weak research, you draw improper conclusions. Even after you were told about a mistake that happened a long time ago in a weight loss study, you continued to make the false claim, try to cover up your mistakes, all this kind of stuff about your character. Can you talk a little bit about what happened? And Yes, I did make a mistake. <laughs> Hey guys, Sherry from The Watering Mouth here. I am coming to you in a very interesting time in our community. <laughs> There's a little bit of controversy going around and I have Dr. Furman again to talk with us a little bit about what's going on and just to sort of sort through some of these things with us to maybe hopefully reduce a little confusion. The way that I do things on my channel, I try to just keep things calm, like stick to the facts. Let's just do what works for us. I think what we find when we're trying to go to this uh, you know, diet that maybe is different than something we did before, it can be difficult. And so it can be easy to get off track and, uh, and kind of go back to where we were. So I just wanna create like a place where we can feel safe and just talk about what needs to be talked about, the difficulties, the ease. How do we kind of just get to eating more plants and get to what I think is the optimal diet? Like I think this word of um, optimizing is super, super important. We can eat, you know, I kind of think of it like a spectrum, right? Like standard American diet, maybe nutritarian on the other end. We just want to be able to go to our best version of what's going to make us feel the best and heal the best and all that kind of stuff, have longevity and all that great stuff. So today I brought on Dr. Furman. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Great to be here and talk to you again. Yeah. For sure. Okay, so we're going to get into this and um, down in the comment section, let me know what you guys are thinking about this as you're going through this interview. Are you learning some things? Let's just keep things to this positive, uplifting type of content and comments that are going to create more happiness and health and love and positivity in our life. Okay, so let's get into it. So it's going to be kind of an interesting interview and I've already told Dr. Furman that this is going to be a little bit blunt. <laughs> I kind of wanted to do like a little Diane Sawyer-esque, just blunt questions. What's out there? And I want to see what you have to say to those questions. Okay, so we're a little prepared for the fact that we're going to do this. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. Okay. Sure. My first question is, well, it's not so much a question. These are kind of criticisms of you, all right? And I'm going to say them bluntly, and I know you can handle it because you're from Jersey and you got this, <laughs> all right? I'm actually originally from New York. From New York, well, there you go. Yeah, we got a New Yorker on our hands, so. I've so lived in Jersey now for 29 years. Okay, so you'll be able to handle whatever, whatever mm -hmm. I throw at you. <laughs> all right, here we go. So first question is that, or first sort of criticism or question is that, Dr. Furman, you have specifically modified a plant-based diet um, to have very high nutrient content. And they're saying that you've done this, you've modified this diet to have something specific to sell um, versus the other plant-based doctors. Can you kind of um, respond to that idea of the high nutrient thing and why that is important or, you know, people are saying it's not, but why is that important? Right. Um, I'm, I'm essentially agreeing with that, that I do um, that I devise the nutritarian diet or, or support or advocate a nutritarian diet that's somewhat different than a general plant-based or vegan diet. Because even though I do advocate a person have a plant-based diet, I want their diet to be mostly on the healthiest plant foods they can possibly eat and eliminating those or reducing those that are not as health, healthy. In other words, my niche in this um, that I choose for myself intentionally is to try to design what's ideal, might be the gold standard which can enable a person to not get cancer, to, the, to protect against cancer most powerfully, to slow aging the most, or to extend human longevity. And also when you utilize that therapeutically, you can more effectively reverse disease like lupus, psoriasis, heart disease, you know, diabetes, weight loss, whatever the condition is, right? So, I, so I'm trying to um, give people the ideal to strive for, and they could choose to do that or not, because I feel that if I gave some watered down version that's more acceptable or more popular in the community, then people will always do a little bit less or they may not get the results they want. And I don't want to sell out those people who want what's very best and are willing to do what's very best to get those extra results, which may be a longer life without dementia and more protection against cancer, especially for those people that maybe didn't eat so healthfully for the first 50% or three quarters of their life. And they really want to do what's best now to maximally support their immune system and their body's ability to repair and heal and live as long as they possibly can. So I don't know, I don't see that as a criticism that my diet's a little bit different or a little, that I designed it to be um, 
as protective as I possibly could and not water it down to make it more acceptable. But in doing so, as you're aware, I put a lot of effort into making it taste good, into having people take the time to make this enjoyable in the way they prefer to eat and to realize it's not so um, aggressive or radical for health that it makes it impossible to do it. I want this to be, and I, I do think that's really accurate because I've seen over the years that people can do this, they enjoy it, they enjoy the recipes and the foods. And just because it's a little more strict in saying, well, you shouldn't eat so much rice or brown rice because of arsenic or high glycemic foods, as many white potatoes and white rice. We want to eat more vegetables, more beans, more nuts, more berries, more high nutrient plants that are more protective. I think that's, it's important. And, um, it, you know, it's an important, I think it's a very important message so people can have something that they can understand the protective nature of these foods and how powerful the scientific studies are showing their effects to um, stabilize stem cell maintenance for later life use and to stabilize telomeres and to improve immune function later in life so we don't have risk of infection and to be protective for the brain and brain shrinkage with aging. I'm looking at every box to check off every box to not leave anything un unchecked or unaddressed that may be important for a certain segment of the population to extend their lifespan. And I'm very proud of doing what I do, of, of, of doing that, even if other people aren't quite, quite at the same place. But I have to say that a lot of lifestyle medicine doctors do utilize my books and my methods in their practices. When the American College of Lifestyle Medicine did a survey of, of what physicians' books they use, they recommended the most to their patients, my books came out on top, which was a real um, honor to have that night. So I, I think that, that it's an, an important niche that I play here and not water, to not give watered down information to fit in with everybody else. I don't think that's necessary that I do that. So next question, and this is a big one because I think there's a lot of talk about this going on right now. It's the question of the controversy around nuts and seeds in your diet and whether or not they're important, whether they're useful. So first question is that something is said that um, some people simply cannot lose weight while eating any nuts and seeds. Um, and that if you're an addict, um, you might need to have zero nuts and seeds in order to be able to lose weight. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, well, I have to start by saying, let's, what's, what's the basic premise of a nutritarian diet? Or what are the most critical things people should know to live a long time in slow aging? And one of the most critical things is moderate caloric restriction. And I'm also saying in the context of nutritional excellence or micronutrient excellence or excellent exposure to all nutrients humans need, we're not exceeding our caloric requirements. And I'm also suggesting that when you do have an excellent exposure to micronutrients, then you can better control your appetite. Because when you're deficient and you're not eating healthy, you become a calorie consuming monster. It's hard to really control your appetite. The healthier you eat, the better it able, you're able to control your your appetite. And nuts and seeds are part of a healthy diet. They facilitate absorption of, of um, phytochemicals and antioxidants. Vitamin E's like tocotrienols, tocopricols, terpenes. There's all types of flavonoids that are better absorbed, carotenoids, when you have exposure to some fat in the meal. So it gives you better nutrient exposure and it's generally associated with longer life and all, from all-cause mortality. There are always some unusual um, what's the word, individuals who have a, 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 you know, an, a very unique um, relationship with certain foods you know, that could trigger their overeating behaviors and addictions. You know, so it's never a one-size-fits-all approach. If there's a particular individual who eats a cashew nut and can't not eat the whole box, then she shouldn't be eating the cashew nuts. But that's not, that would be extremely uncommon. I don't think that, you know, so I, I've obviously, as you know, been worked as, as for almost 30 years now as a physician taking care of this community of people who are generally sickly and overweight with medical problems. And I don't think I've almost can ever think of, you know, I've heard about a couple of people, but I've never experienced one in my medical practice that over time couldn't learn how to control that, to measure out the nuts and seeds and eat the right amount with their meal and not eat them between meals and not binge on them. And, and they don't have to eliminate them, the nuts and seeds from their diet totally would be making their diet less nutritionally sound. So we would prefer a person not have to do that. But if an individual had to do that temporarily or for a period of time to get their appetite or their, their addictions under control, then if that's necessary for them, so then it's necessary for them. I wouldn't be against that if it was the only choice that they had to make. Yeah, I know from my experience, I had a similar issue and I found that 
once I finally gave up dates, <laughs> it really helped with eating too many nuts because when you put dates and nuts together, it's like so amazing, right? Delicious. But once I finally I gave up. I think that's true. It's these people who claim nuts are doing them in. It's always they're eating desserts, they're mixing in dates, they're using them in, yeah. they're, eating, they're doing them in ways they shouldn't be utilizing them. Yeah, and they're I not measuring them out and putting them into a salad dressing with a limited amount with each meal and putting them, you know, there's, there's certain techniques and yeah. advice we can give people to deal with that obstacle of trying to control their, their addictive nature to certain foods and not just make a whole food sort, a whole food category off limits as the solution. You know, right. at least try not to make a whole food category off limits if we don't have to, you know? What I mean? Yeah, and what you said I think is really important because I found that in my journey too. I've been a nutritarian for six years and the, the time where I was having issues with nuts and seeds, it was slowly but surely getting better and better until I gave up the dates and then it was like, oh, I don't even think about nuts and seeds as a snack food anymore, which is amazing to me that that could even happen because so i think for so long as you're doing this you're thinking oh this this part of it can't be true for me or this part of it is maybe true for dr Furman, but not for me and so i was really like testing things over the years to figure this out and when i finally got over the whole like overeating on nuts thing i was like wait a minute <laughs> like it was that easy i just had to give up dates yeah so it can take some time i think and people shouldn't be sitting there and snacking on nuts for sure that's not a that's yeah. something that none of us recommend certainly yeah. i wouldn't recommend Exactly. Okay. So um, the other question about nuts and seeds is nuts and seeds should not be used for heart disease patients. Like maybe it's okay for some people to have nuts and seeds, but definitely not for heart disease, cardiovascular risk type people. Can you respond to that? Yeah. You know, I want to make it clear that my viewpoint on that is not unique. I mean, what I'm saying right now is the vast amount of nutritional scientists in the world today studying this issue. Are, are, are stating these same things. It's a very small number, or I could say an unusual amount of a, of a small, that are actually advocating that people not eat nuts and seeds who have heart disease, because the evidence is so overwhelming that nuts and seeds are one of the most protective foods for the heart. For example, in the Physician's Health Study report, they found that eating a small amount of nuts and seeds in the diet compared to none reduced the risk of sudden cardiac death by almost 60%. I think it was 57% reduction in sudden cardiac death. Not as much as overall heart attack deaths. They tried very hard in that study to identify sudden cardiac death, people who died you know, right away when they started getting symptoms due to an irregular heartbeat, or people when they even did autopsies to see if the cause of death was, was sudden cardiac death, you know, to, um, to identify the cause of death, thinking that the lack of nuts, how nuts and seeds had some ingredients that were protective against irregular heartbeat. So I, you know, so we're talking here about a vast majority of studies, a large number of studies on that, um, that the majority of which were not supported by the nut industry as was claimed by some people, and the majority of which were well controlled for other variables, such as meat intake, vegetable intake, fish intake, egg intake, quality of diet, smoking, obesity, they were control factors. And the, the studies showed that in both um, omnivorous and vegetarian populations, nuts and seeds still had tremendous effects, predominantly against cardiovascular death. Um, so I think that um, it's quite radical extracting nuts and seeds from a person's diet, especially with heart disease and quite radical to try to convince people that it's dangerous to eat a walnut as such a protective food, especially when you're eating these foods in moderate amounts. To, to make people fearful of eating those foods when they have heart disease is a problem. And don't forget, I've been doing, I've been working as a physician in this field for almost 30 years now. I've taken care of many hundreds of people with advanced heart disease with spectacular results, all, take, all with eating some amount of nuts and seeds in their diet. And you know, you'd have to say that, um, that and a lot of these cases are on my website in the success story cases, I, you know, of people who read one after another after another. They're real people with the real photos there. Um, in any case, there's so many thousands of people that have benefited from my nutritional approach. You don't need to exclude nuts and seeds from your diet to reverse heart disease. And in doing so, seems to be... Um, in the scientific literature, if we look at the vast amount and the overwhelming amount of evidence, we see that to do so is most likely going to increase a person's risk of dying. So uh, here I'll quote from a, a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. I have it right here. I'll read it word for word. Yeah. It says, 
enlarged prospective epidemiologic study of Seventh-day Adventists in California, we found that frequent, that the frequency of nut consumption had a substantial and highly significant inverse association with the risk of myocardial, infar myocardial infarction and death from ischemic heart disease. So an inverse means the more nuts, the lower the risk of heart disease. Then they say significant. And then this, pers this some studies, these studies part um, particularly goes on to say, it goes on to study about other studies show similar things that, uh, docu that document this is not one study. And, it's, and this is important sentence, the next two sentences. The protective effect of nuts on ischemic heart disease has been found in men and women and in the elderly. Importantly, nuts have a similar associations in both vegetarians and non-vegetarians, meaning some people say Seventh-day Adventists are 30% um, vegetarian. Some people say, I've read some studies that say they're 50% vegetarian, but a lot of vegetarians in these studies and people of all types, including vegans and some vegetarians who are eating some dairy products. So there's a lot of different, and they said in every one of those categories, the addition of nuts and seeds reduced cardiovascular deaths. The same studies show that more animal products in the diet, because they had, very, they had people here with very low amounts of animal products, or up to more moderate amounts, and they showed as animal products went up, compared the lowest quintile to the highest quintile, increased death by almost 60%, and comparing the lowest quintile, or five different groups of nut and seed consumption to the highest, showed a 40% variation in the risk of heart cardiovascular deaths. And this included vegan populations. We're talking about higher risk of death from not including nuts and seeds. These studies are particularly important because they follow people for decades, in this case, probably almost 20 years. And because they do so, they can really look at hard endpoints like death and see if there's any risk. So looking at a, um, they're, they're much more comprehensive with larger numbers of people. They're looking at a population of 90,000 people. So they can see really the data that, that really comes out of these. They're very powerful um, studies and they're corroborated by other studies. So let me just say, read this. The, um, positive effect of nut consumption on ischemic heart disease is not offset by increased mortality from other causes, like developing obesity, you know, something else. Moreover, it's the frequency of nut consumption has been found to be inversely related to all cause mortality in several population groups, such as whites, blacks, and the elderly. Nuts and seeds may not only offer protection against ischemic heart disease, but also increase longevity. So that's, um, that's a commenter on the, in the medical journal about the Seventh-day Adventist trials. But, um, you know, there's, you know, I did go through a list of almost all the studies, long-term studies showing nuts and seeds, because the long-term studies have more power to look at this than the few randomized controlled trials, which are better you're looking at soft endpoints over short periods of time, but you're not gonna see deaths being a hard endpoint or heart attacks, unless you go to trials that are going on for, for longer periods of time. And that's where these, these um, problems are identified. And, they, and these researchers do control for those factors. That some, so the people that are knocking or saying these studies are not um, conclusive, you know, aren't, it's really not accurate. And, they, and they're, um, the, accurate, the most accurate information is we have to be very precautionary. We have to take care here with telling people to wouldn't take all the nuts and seeds out of the diet and make the diet low that low in fat because there are because the diet that low in fat may be increasing the irritability of the heart and the propensity of developing an irregular heartbeat or an irregular or an arrhythmia and given and you know you could argue my religion is better than your religion my study is better than your study your study was a survey study my study was this study you, you know you but I don't think really that's the issue. I think it's not just looking at my study versus your study. It's looking at all the studies done by everybody on this issue, right? And my 30 years of experience treatment of thousands of patients is, is, has a lot, has a big role to play here. And I have to say, I'm, I'm very um, blessed to have had the opportunity to have affected so many hundreds of thousands of people to improve their health, because we're all in this objective to try to encourage people to eat a healthier diet you know, and get them on a better, on a better health. I've been lucky enough to have my shows air on PBS that were very successful. I've actually sold millions of books and have, you know, many people have been read and changed by my advice who have never come to see me as a patient. They've just read my books or watched the videos or on the PBS television shows and they've sent me 
their success stories and emails and their results. It's been so personally rewarding to see, to have that effect on people, have a positive effect in people's lives. And I'm, I'm, I'm so honored to have that, to people have, that I've been able to have those opportunities to do that. So really, um, it's really a, a great thing. And I think that there's a certain responsibility here to try to give people um, to the best information I possibly can. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Totally agree with that. And I want to agree also just with the personal point of this that I've not only gotten over food addiction issues and lost the weight and easily lost the weight after my pregnancy. I mean, just easy, right? Because I already had this sort of patterns put into place from before the pregnancy. But my brothers lost almost 90 pounds. My mom reversed her type 2 diabetes. Like, this trickles down, right? And the more we kind of do this, the, the, just the better it gets, so. Now, I always say get superpowers, because as people take, put the oxygen mask on their cells and fix their own body, they radiate, radiate out goodwill for other people and other yeah. people get up benefits too, because they become a role model. And you can look on, you know, if you, you can see all the, the scores of people that have lost more than 100 pounds and kept mm -hmm. it off for years. You know, so who's talking about that? It is all the people that have, the, the people that have lost so much weight and been able to permanently keep it off on this program, you know, and they're all over the place and they're all over my website. And I, you know, I'm, I mention them in my books and my shows, but there, but people, there's, there's literally hundreds of success stories, people telling the story on my, on my website, discussing what happened to them when they changed their diet. Yeah. I love one message that I've heard you say so many times before, which has touched me and is touching the audience because I'm bringing this message to them as well as this idea of who could you be if food wasn't your issue? Right? Like, where is your creativity? Where are all the things that you could be doing that you're not doing now? And I, I got that from you. I love that message so much. So, Absolutely. We, come, we become a much more fuller and complete human being, able to get things accomplished in our life and be happier, too, when we take better care of our health, unquestionably. Yeah. That Agreed. fast food is destroying people's creativity, intelligence, and happiness. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay, so one last thing on the nuts and seeds issue. Can you talk a little bit about the benefits from the substitution of not eating meat from nuts and seeds? How, how does that relate together? Yeah, absolutely, because that's a good point you're making, is that certainly when you eat more beans, when you eat nuts and seeds, when you eat more green vegetables, you're crowding out things that in your diet, higher glycemic carbohydrates, unhealthy foods, more animal products. So certainly, as we eat more of these healthy foods, we're going to have more be able to eat less unhealthy foods. So that's very important. Replacement calories plays a role. But one thing we want to make clear that the scientific studies are not erred in nuts and seeds being beneficial just because of the crowding out effects of, of meats and other bad foods. That's not what's happening here because those have been adequately controlled for. I was having this conversation with Kim Williams about two weeks ago. Kim Williams, um, he's the... Oh. Um... He was a former president of the American College of Cardiology and a well-known cardiologist now advocates a vegan, a plant-based diet, vegan diet for his patients. He's a wonderful guy. And he's also now, um, the, I think, the chief editor of the um, International Journal of Disease Prevention Reversal. So I was interacting with him about a consort, talking about a new research article or editorial we were going to write for the journal that was going to talk about this issue. And he brought up, at first he brought up his, that, that maybe most of the studies show such so much benefit is because people eating more nuts and seeds, eating less meat, and that was may, maybe one of the major factors. So I showed him all the studies and how, which, how they showed in vegetarian. I showed him that the studies that showed even in the vegetarian populations and how meat was controlled for. And when they controlled for that variable, they showed the exact same powerful relationship. So he was very glad and excited to see this data and review all the studies I showed him. And he was being happy, you know, very, very open and, um, and informative and excited about learning more about this, these issues and felt really um, what's the word excited the fact that nuts and seeds have this protective effect even in vegan populations. And it's not just about crowding out the meat. The benefits are much more broad and, um, and, de and more depth and much more, um, much more in depth with much more mechanisms involved, the uh, you know, antioxidant effects, vitamin E absorption, carotenoid absorption, stabilizing the heart against arrhythmia, lower degree of inflammation. More, you know, there's a lot of factors involved here. It's not just not eating meat. So that's been adequately addressed. And he's, he, doc, Dr. Williams is, is aware of that now. And he wants me to work on this article with him about this. And that actually reminds me because I have a friend who was going through Ornish's heart disease program at his local hospital because he had heart attacks and was trying to get mm -hmm. healthy. And I was actually at one of the classes with him 
when Ornish changed his program from being a no, I think it was strictly no fat to like including a little bit of nuts and seeds. And I found out later actually through you that that was a lot of your influence in the nutritarian diet. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that went down? I think so. You know, I, I think that Dr. Ornish is such a great person. He's such a um, loving and caring individual for people. Whenever I had um, broached the subject with him, he always would sit down and talk to me in a very interested manner and consider what I had to say and wanting to learn more and, you know, think about the mechanisms involved. And so I felt that he was always um, a true scientist and really not being, not being blinded or had his mind firmly made up and willing to consider the, that evidence. So he did for years. And I think I, I, might have, I had these conversations with him and I had, and eventually, I, when I, I was, I wanted to make sure when I wrote the end of heart disease, I was representing him correctly. So, I, so we had a little more interaction. Um, and, and I real, and he told me that he was putting some nuts and seeds back in his program because he wants to, he wants to be concerned about this issue of um, taking it out completely, not being as good as using some in the diet. He doesn't want people to overeat on them either. But, um, but so I, I felt that his concern and his, he changed eventually because the overwhelming amount of evidence became something that he didn't want to ignore at this point. And I might have, might have contributed to him being aware of that overwhelming amount of evidence in a friendly way. And he was always very friendly and I support his work very much. And, um, and maybe we don't agree on everything, but I think that we can discuss these things in a very friendly way. I mean, maybe I wouldn't recommend quite as much DHA, you know, like the fish oils, the DHA EPA that he recommends. I'm thinking maybe a little lower amount might be better. He's recommending a larger amount, but it's something that can be discussed. I'm willing to, um, consider looking at the evidence, and he so is he. So I think that's a, a um, something that's a can continue. We can continue discussing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, let's get into a couple more criticisms here. I think we've kind of got the nuts and seeds thing figured out here a bit. And of course, you know, everyone make your own decisions. This is um, this is just what, as he was saying. We're going to just talk about this. We can discuss it and see what works for us, right? Mm -hmm. So here's another criticism of you. Um, based on some stuff that's going on in this controversy, that you have weak research, that you draw improper conclusions, even after you were told about a mistake that happened a long time ago in a weight loss study, you continued to make the false claim, you try to cover up your mistakes, you know, all this kind of stuff about your character. Can you talk a little bit about what happened and why people are thinking this about you? Yes, I did make a mistake. Well, I didn't say I made a mistake, but I, I didn't, certainly didn't cover it up at all. But he, so yes, there was a mistake that I had turned over a hundred charts to a researcher who was going to review the data from my office of how much weight people are losing, who came in for a visit to see me and had weight loss written on with a problem list. And I didn't have books out then. I had no weight loss program in my office. I didn't have food addiction counselors. I just spent a little visit talking about the way I think they should eat. So they, so they followed these people over time by looking at their charts. Um, there was, a mis so that was done like in the early part of 2000s, and then the, the study finally came out in 2008. Um, I, I'm a busy physician. I trusted the researcher to do the data, and she had a statistician actually helping her um, add up the data and write it up. Um, so I did not review the numbers and, and put my stamp on it. I just thought they were right. And I'm not, an, I'm not a, at that point, I was a clinician seeing patients all day long. I wasn't the wouldn't, wouldn't have the expertise even to find to probably have found a mistake, you know, look at it that carefully. But I had, um, but in any case, um, there was a mistake found, somebody looking in this, looking at that, and we can go into the reasons why it was um, looked at by, because I was being, um, it had to do with research, going after research funding, and somebody was criticizing me for trying to um, collect nonprofit research to fund research articles by nutritional researchers that would be studying nutrition. So that again was, um, something I was very passionate about. Um, so yes, when that study, when the mistake was made, um, I was making some claims about the study that were exaggerated because I thought the study did show those things that were exaggerated. And they found a mistake, I think it wasn't 53 pounds or 57 pounds of weight loss, it was 37 pounds of weight loss because they used the wrong data, they used the wrong um, initial number of people to use the, as the average weight to begin with. It was some um, mistake at which they made. So I was basing my statements about it based on the, um, about the mistakes in the study, but I certainly was not responsible for making that um, mistake. And I think that, other, that in any case, when that mistake was brought about, I stopped making any claims about the study. Um, the researcher who made the error submitted an acknowledgement and a correction into the journal, which was published. 
And also I took the study, I, that, that I don't have that study mentioning it in my um, recent, more recent books. I don't have it listed on my website because there was an error in it, because who knows if there's one, you know. I, so I'm not util, still utilizing the study when the, when the are claiming false claims about it, but I did make claims about that that were wrong. And I, you know, that back then in, in 2009 or 2010, when it came, um, excuse me, so yes, it was an unfortunate situation um, that, in general, and certainly I learned from it. Um, the combination of that, if I'm gonna have my name on a study, I better go through the data and make sure I've read everything part of it, that I approve it, number one. And number two, make sure I'm act very, very accurate because I made the mistake of saying there was 100 people in the study when I had given her 100 charts and then I didn't really look at the, you know, what, how much she eliminated. I didn't really, um, I had forgotten that she had cur curtailed the people down by eliminating and throwing out data. I think I've published at least 12 studies since then and certainly that, um, that was one of my, that study had a, that had an error in it. I, the idea that I purposely, the, I think the criticism of me is that I purposely made the error, that I purposely like had the effect on the study to twist it and lie, to make it look better than I did. That's the really, the real issue here. You yeah. know, people thinking I would actually go in and fake the results to make it look better. You know, that, um, so I mean, I, I think that's the big issue here. I mean, obviously there's no reason to do for me to do that. I, you know, I've been very, very successful, as you know, in getting people their health back. And whether that small amount, whether that one data set with no support, no books, got, got the most weight loss or not, and how many of the people have now, and it's, it's almost irrelevant. It's just the fact that there was an error there. Yeah. Okay. So here's one more thing that um, about you that I think people maybe criticize is that the way you speak, you're a fast talker, you're very blunt and direct, and you make people uneasy. Um, and that you use scare tactics and fear mongering to sell your products, right? Like saying that if you don't do this, you're going to risk these terrible, terrible things, right? And so that's fear mongering and that sort of thing. Can you respond to that? Um, I think those things are true. Um, that, that yes, I talk and talk fast at times. I try to recommend, I try to say to myself, slow down at times. But I think that with my shows on PBS, they encourage me to talk fast. Yeah. They're limited, you know, they do, they, they actually, so they, they like the fact that I can talk quick and get a lot of information out. So yeah. there's advantages and there's disadvantages. A lot of times I'm presenting to audiences and I want to get a lot of information out. I can say, slow down and raise your hand if I want to repeat something, but I'm going to try to, I'm speaking to medical audiences and people that are already knowledgeable and scientifically astute, and they want to get as much information as possible. So there's a pro and con to that. And I try to vary it and slow down in important parts, but I'm, but I'm always can um, make some improvements there. Certainly that's a legitimate criticism that some people have of me, but I could talk fast at times. Okay. Um, the other thing is, is scaremongering? Yeah. Well, I mean- That you do it to sell, that you, you talk about death and dementia and these and alzheimer's and these kinds of things in order to sell more products yikes i mean first of all all people in the health field are all trying to sell something they're trying to sell their books they're trying to sell their 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 their, their events they're trying to sell their, their soups they're trying to sell something i mean certainly i'm not you know i i have sold millions of books and i'm very grateful to have had, had that to have that happen and that's the most thrilling thing of my life it's not just to um it's not just to be economically secure, but secure. It's having the fact that so many people have read my books and benefited from them. And I think it's important that, that yes, I, I, that 40% of Americans die of heart attacks and strokes, almost 40% and almost 30% die of cancer. And we have a growing amount of people becoming depressed and mentally ill and autism. And we have these diseases and it's, is it scaremongering to tell people that they should be concerned about these things and that they don't have to be sick? Um, that I, I, don't, I don't know if I use the word scaremongering. I do want to people to be able to take control of their health destiny and realize they don't have to get breast cancer. They don't have to get demented. And I think it's as opposed to scaremongering, it's giving people hope, hope that they can control their outcomes and have a better, happier life without fear of disease. But it is, you know, a certain degree of scaremongering. If you eat like the way other Americans eat, you know what I mean? If you do what other Americans do, you're going to get into trouble. You're taking too much risk. Yeah. You know? and, and I think what, I think what the underlying thing you're referring to here is something more specific. I think it's that I'm concerned that vegans um, could become at high, could develop dementia due to DHA deficiency on a vegan diet. Yeah. And, the, um, and I, the, the next question is actually about that. And they say, since you do your own research and sell your own supplements, you're hard to trust. 
you shouldn't make money off supplements because it's a conflict of interest and that you sell DHA and EPA, but it's not necessary for everyone. So that's the other criticism. Right. right exactly. That's the same thing. I think that's the, that's the criticism that the other, that the other person say scaremongering. I think yeah. that in some way interrelates with that. You know what I mean? That I'm trying, yeah. I'm selling a DHA product and I'm, no, I'm not doing my own research at all about this. I'm, well, oh, there was one research pr um, study done by the Nutritional Research Foundation that I was not a part of that study, one of the researchers on that project. It's not my own research, but I did, but I was president of the Nutritional Research um, Foundation, which helped fund that study with 166 vegans who were not supplementing the DHA to track their level of omega-3 in their bloodstream to actually ascertain what percent of vegans um, eating a relatively healthy diet would have a low DHA level. You know what I mean? So I think that was important to look at that. So, um, yes, I mean, by the way, um, this is not a Dr. Furman thing. There's a lot of doctors in the lifestyle medicine community advocating the same thing and recognizing that there's a tremendous amount of data showing that low DHA levels are linked to dementia. I, I have the, how should I say, the responsibility to make sure that our advice doesn't damage anybody. And I, and I personally have suffered with my own family members, with my own family, some people in my family that have become um, depressed after a few years on a vegan diet, um, which I think had to do with they're not with their need requiring more DHA and EPA. I've also had personal close, very close personal friends, not only my patients, but all my own personal friends who become, one uh, man, he's still alive, he's in his young, low 80s, and he's demented at this point. Um, he didn't know all those years on a vegan diet he would, that the overwhelming effect of being low in DHA that low for decades could cause brain shrinkage with aging and cause his dementia. Um, I have other people I could, um, I'm not going to mention names. This person, I wouldn't mention a name because he's a celebrity, but I have a, you know, I, I'm very, very concerned about this and I've seen the damage in my own, with my own friends and family over the years um, that the potential for DHA deficiency causing a problem. And because I was recommending DHA a long time ago because of seeing these problems, um, I had noted that people were getting indigestion and burping and I would taste the fish oil or the algae oil and found it, taste, it didn't taste fresh, it was rancid tasting. You know, so I looked to have a source of DHA that could be um, better for my family, my friends, my clients and my patients. So I started packing it in glass bottles, having it made for us in small amounts, packing it in glass bottles and keeping it refrigerated so, so that I wouldn't be advocating a vegan diet that could get anybody in trouble. Now, keep in mind that um, it's very, very important. People are selling all kinds of things. Um, we're selling books. Doctors sell, are selling, um, you know, they sell their services and they're doing, putting stents in people that don't need stents. They're doing... Um, they're giving people drugs who don't need drugs and keeping them on drugs for the rest of their lives. So they can see them on multiple times each year and keep seeing these patients. But they could have just told them, informed consent, that, that the drugs could increase risk of cancer. They can increase risk of another problem that you, don't, that you should be aware of. And it's much healthier if you change your diet. In other words, what I'm saying right now is everybody's selling something. The issue here is, is what you're selling, is it really something that's going to be beneficial to the population? Is it something important? Are you giving people good value? And I felt that I'm, I'm developing something necessary for my recommendations. If I'm recommending people take a DHA that's, that's refrigerated and not rancid and doesn't have microplastic particles in it, you know, microplastics are a big thing in, in seafood and sea, you know, if, if I want to make something pre well for myself and my family that I'm going to take, and then if I don't, if I don't, um, and of course, like I'm making a ketchup too. I make a ketchup because I want to have a ketchup that has. There's no, no ketchup out there. That's <laughs> there's no, so I can't find one with no sweeteners in them, with no salt in them, with no oil in them, with no, you know, that are organic, that are packed in glass. I don't want my, my tomatoes packed in plastic and have um, plastic materials in my, in my tomatoes. And, the, and now my ketchup is expensive because I'm putting organic stuff in glass bottles and I have to make things in small amounts. But if people want that, at least it's available for those people that want it. It is expensive and it's gonna be two or three times as much as regular ketchup because you know, if a lot of people were buying this ketchup and we could make it in huge volumes, it would be much cheaper. But I'm doing the best I can to make things that are available that I think are important. And because there's a demand, because people who follow my advice yeah. want to be able to do, want to be able to do what I'm telling them to do. And they can't do what I'm telling them to do if I don't make the ketchup and make the DHA that's, in, that's refrigerated and not have micro, you know, I don't want them to take high dose fish oils with, you know, and rancid supplements. Yeah. So I'm trying to develop what I think is right for people. 
and, and I do give a lot of, of money to that's made to the, to the nutritional research and to other you know, charities. In other words, the point is that that's my um, personal love and interest is, is putting money into nutritional research, but I want to keep the, the event, get the prices down so people can afford them better too. Um, you know, so, but in any case, I'm not saying that every person needs to take a DHA supplement, by the way. If you want not to take a DHA supplement, you could do a blood test that are available nowadays, and you could ascertain if your blood test is adequate. I am saying that you're taking a big risk if you don't keep your DHA at a favorable level, and you should be aware of the studies. I mean, you know, this is not, these are not my studies. You know, this is, these, this is just, it's, you know, I am saying it's a little bit irresponsible to just assume that an unsupplemented vegan diet which no society has followed for generations in the history of the human race is going to be safe. And the people are saying, well, if it's, by the way, if it's low in B12, it might be low in other things too, if you're not eating animal products. Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure that people are safe in following my advice and giving people products that I stand behind and I feel are important for their health. And let me, and I can just show you a couple of studies here, hold yeah. something here. More than a dozen epidemiologic studies have reported that reduced levels of in or intake of omega-3 fatty acids or fish consumption is associated with increased risk for age-related co cognitive decline or dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, increased dietary consumption or blood levels of DHA appear protective for Alzheimer's and other dementias in multiple epidemiologic studies. And it goes into the mechanisms of neuroprotective metabolites, reduced arachidonic acid metabolites, increased trophic factors or downstream trophic signal transducers, um, the accumulation of amyloid beta toxin that's behaved to drive um, dementia, um, and, the and the also the, the idea that you can't be deficient your whole life and then start taking it when you start to get memory loss, it's gonna fix it. It doesn't make the brain grow back. Once you shrink the brain, I'm not saying that um, EPA and DHA is used therapeutically to reverse dementia. And I know that, in, that people who are trying to deny this, the importance of taking this and thinking that, oh, this, this is crazy, are gonna show studies that show that taking DHA doesn't reverse dementia or doesn't, hasn't been shown to fix people who are with memory loss. And I'm not claiming, that's not what I'm claiming. Yeah. I'm actually agreeing with that, that that's why I want people to take it before they get demented because once your brain shrinks, you just can't grow your brain back again once you have 30, 40, 50 years of having DHA deficiency, um, which if you're a doctor like me, it's very emotionally traumatizing to see somebody you really care about losing their brain as they age and losing their mind because you kept them alive and they're in great health and, and they don't have their, and their brain, they lost their brain function. It's very, very concerning. And the point here I think is that shouldn't people, scientists and individuals um, given all the studies, and I'm just, I just mentioned one, I just started to quote from one study. I mean, obviously there's, there's lots and lots of studies here, and I, I, that's what I review um, a lot of data here. It's not my study that I'm, to, that I'm determining the, this information. I'm reviewing hundreds of studies to get this information on, this, on these issues. You know? um, so what I'm saying right now, if you're going to err, wouldn't it be wise to err on the side of caution? which most people looking at this issue were agreeing with me on. If, you're gonna, if there's a chance that DHA deficiency, as shown in the literature, can lead to um, shrinkage of the brain, isn't it precautionary and conservative not to blindly follow some advice of telling you not to worry about this on a vegan diet? You know, it's something that should be a concern. And if you're, so, if you're strongly um, not want to take any supplements, then you should at least, I, I think it's advisable to draw a blood level, which are available today, to see whether your level is adequate, borderline, insufficient, or deficient, or severely deficient. And then you could make up your, then you could help decide based on that information of whether you want to take the risk or not. So I, I feel that um, not only am I in the right on this issue, but I feel passionate that it's important that I'm doing what I'm doing. And this is necessary for people to get the right information and to be protected. And so it is, you know, it's not fear or scaremongering, it's being conservative and, and precautionary. Yeah. And, and you know what? And, and joyous and excited about it, that we don't have to worry about dementia. 
Because once you eat all these fruits, because they, they can also show studies, well, when you eat more vegetables, you have less risk of dementia. Of course, when you eat more vegetables, you have less risk of dementia. Vegetables protect against dementia. But, you can, but, even, but the problem here is that for some people, especially for those individuals who genetically don't convert of the, enough of that ALA into EPA and DHA, because there's a difference in conversion enzyme, and that's what those studies show, that we're not all mirror images of each other. We're not all robots, and some people will be more hurt by that advice than others. And it doesn't matter whether it's 1% or 5% or 10% that could get hurt by that advice. It doesn't matter because one person is too much. Is, is, yes. that's, one person being hurt needlessly is, a need, is needless damage to that individual. And we have a responsibility to do what we can so that doesn't happen. You know, the medical profession, you know, we can sell anything that's to people to try to make money to, that may even be hurting them. And most of what doctors do, whether it's selling things or what, you know, whether you're, you're selling something's good like a book, or you're selling a vegetable soup or something, right? There are books out there that have bad information in them. That's like the carnivore diet or something. Yeah. But you know, it's not a question of whether you're selling something to make money. The question is, is what you're selling going to help people or going to hurt people? Is what you know? Is there that you know? Is are you being? Can you be trusted in the in your judgment and the science that people can hear what you have to say, and then they should be intelligent enough to really not just you know go look into more depth. Look at the data, look at the study, see if the evidence is supportive and then make the right decision for yourself. And there's so much bad information in selling of, of things that hurt people out there. It's not that people, you know, people are selling everything. Even the people saying you shouldn't be selling supplements, they're selling something too that may be bad or may be good. I think it's totally, um, you know, it has to do with the pharmacologic basis of the medical profession, I think, where it's okay to sell, you know, to sell um, upper endoscopies and every person that walks in the, the, um, the door with, an up, with a reflux, or it's okay to put elective stents in people who would have been better off changing their diet, and it's okay to give them drugs instead of changing their diet so they can have to come back and buy drugs for the rest of their life and come back for visits four to five times a year, which they didn't need to have to happen to keep the doctors busy all the time. All these things are okay, but to give somebody a nutritional supplement that is necessary for their particular diet style or for the way they're eating that they might be missing in their diet or something they hate to live longer, that's and going to free them from needing medical care and spending, you know, that's not acceptable. And I think this, I think this what's the word, um, begins with an, with an underlying, you know, favorable, um, at the, the way medicine is practiced today. We have a drug-centered medical care. Anything that's not drug-centered is looked at not evidence-based. And we know that even the drug practices are mostly not evidence-based. And the evidence putting stents, elective stents is not evidence-based. And so much of what doctors do is not evidence-based. And we're trying to, that I, in the nutritarian diet, I am recommending the conservative use of supplements as part of the diet. And if you think that that's bogus and you're against that, you don't have to do it, right? But I am recommending that a vegan diet may not be ideal, not just for DHA, but for B12 and for zinc particularly. You know, zinc binds cadmium. We have a lot of cadmium contamination in our environment. Zinc is important for immune system degradation as we age to maintain immune system stability with aging. And, a v and you don't only bind 20%, um, you only absorb 20% of the zinc in plant foods compared to about 80% in animal products. Mm -hmm. We have much greater zinc absorption in animal products. I'm more concerned about micronutrient excellence. And I do have a think that, these, that this adds an element of protection in later life to my recommendations. And therefore, I do recommend certain supplements to go along with excellent consumption of natural plant foods. And if you think this is all erroneous and you want to believe some other person's viewpoint and saying this is all nonsense, you don't need anything, you have that right to review the evidence and do whatever you want to do. But I feel very, that I feel, um, very confident and proud of the, of the um, advice I give people and that I'm going to give them the best possible advice to protect their precious health because they only have one life, one body, one brain, and we don't want to mess it up. You know what I mean? So I'm, so I'm very, um, so I want to do what I feel is best for my, the people that are depending on me for advice. Yeah. And I think this point, and I want to just kind of bring it back to where we started, this other idea of who can we be if we become optimal, right? Like if, if our nutrition, if we get the nutrition part optimal, if we get our disease prevention and reversal going, if we get our food addictions lowered and we just start feeling better about ourselves, then where do we get to go, right? So it's the difference between do you want to just 
kind of like do what's comfortable or do you want to do what's optimal for life? And I love that concept of being able to become who we're meant to be when food isn't our thing. Yeah. That's absolutely. And, and keep in mind that I am, I'm somewhat of leading a leader in this community of, of, of lifestyle medicine physicians. A lot of physicians are, depend on me to review the literature and go and give them advice on how to care for patients. They call me on the phone with patients in need with, with who have medical conditions that are quite advanced or quite confusing. I've had the years of experience of having to help people get well and modify the recommendations and change the, you know, maybe adjust some supplements or change the diet for a person with a problem. And I'm really, um, I feel very um, grateful and very proud of the fact that, I, that doctors can, do call on me and use me for advice. Other physicians have used, utilized me for advice. As a man, and I've mentored many physicians and who are now um, lifestyle medicine physicians who utilize a lot of the work that I set the foundation of years ago, and they continue to be um, doctors that are changing the world. And um, I just don't want to make, I want to make it clear here that I'm not alone. I'm not the only person saying this message. There's a lot, there's thousands of physicians that are utilizing these same method, methods, techniques, and are excited about this and trying in their heart to do the very best that they can with, each, with their patients. And it's, such, it's so wonderful to see this, you know, when you, when you have that in your toolbox to be able to help quickly fully and you're confident that you can give them the best, you know, and get people well again. That's the main, of course, the, the big reward here is watching people get well and the excitement involved in watching people get well. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Furman, for everything that you said here. I, um, I'm just really honored that you took the time to talk to us and to, and to kind of go through some of these things. I think it really gives a good um, picture of what's going on. So thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Of course, wishing you all the best and certainly all your listeners to have great health and super happiness and stay well. Thank you. Okay, guys, so you heard it from Dr. Furman. Um, down below in the comment section, let me know. Let's talk a little bit about what, was there something you learned in this interview or something that you really thought was positive or you're coming away with that you want to use in your life as well or you want to share with your family members or friends? Let us know down below. Let's have a little discussion about that. What we're trying to do with our life, what we're trying to create and become our most optimal selves and just get better. That's what we're trying to do. Okay. So let's talk about this kind of stuff down in the comment section. Um, and as always, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and click that notification button so you can um, get notified every time I publish a new video. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.